Look up into the sky on even a not so dark night and there's a good chance you'll see it. Mars, the red planet. Not so long ago, this remote world was thought to be teeming with life. The late 19th century saw a craze for spotting canals on the distant surface. In the 1920s, it was thought radio transmissions by intelligent beings might be emanating from it. As recently as the mid-20th century, some scientists still held out hope that lichen might cling to Martian rocks, a sign that life on Earth is not alone. Sadly, that hope has long since died. Today we know Mars is a sterile, desiccated world, a desert planet that once hosted rivers and oceans, but has now been barren for billions of years. But what if we could change that? What if we humans could reverse the process, resurrecting Mars like some planet-sized Lazarus? Right now, some very clever people believe this sci-fi dream is possible. Guys like Elon Musk or Jim Green, the former director of NASA's Planetary Science Division. Guys who believe terraforming Mars is not just a hypothetical possibility, but something our great-grandkids might actually live to witness. In today's episode, we're taking a quick look at the recent science and research into terraforming Mars and trying to figure out if this is really a possibility or just the ultimate pipe dream. If aliens had arrived in our solar system about 4 billion years ago, they'd have no doubt been sure which planet would be considered best for supporting life. Mars at this time was a water world, one on which great seas were fed by surging rivers, one in which waterfalls cascaded over rocks, warm rivers lapped at rugged shores, and maybe, just maybe, simple life had managed to evolve. In this era, the Martian atmosphere wasn't a thin, wispy thing, but it was thick enough to hold in heat. The core still generated a magnetic field, protecting the young world from radiation. From the perspective of our visiting aliens, it would have looked like the most promising place in the solar system. A huge step above the magma-spewing dumpster fire that we call Earth. Sadly, though, this temperate Mars would turn out to be a mere blip in the planet's evolution. Like home buyers who snap up property only to discover it's built across a fault line filled with termites, our fictional aliens would quickly discover planet 4 oh, is far from a paradise. Around 3 billion years ago, Mars's magnetic field disappeared. What followed was a slow, unstoppable death. Its shield gone, the planet's atmosphere was slowly stripped away by the solar wind until what remained was too thin to sustain surface water. By the time the first humans evolved on Earth, Mars was a long dead world, a place inimical to life as we know it. All of which will present something of a challenge if we attempt to colonize it. While we've established outposts in hostile environments here on Earth, like Antarctica for example, uh, we've rarely done so in a place where the air itself is constantly trying to kill us. But that's what the Martian atmosphere will absolutely try to do. A stunning 96% of it is carbon dioxide, with the rest mostly made up of argon and nitrogen. Now, this is a challenge, as an atmosphere made up of only 10% CO2 is enough to cause humans to suffocate. But this pales next to the issue of atmospheric pressure. At just 0.6% the thickness of our atmosphere, Mars falls into the uncomfortable region where your blood will literally boil in your veins if you step outside without a spacesuit. Not that you'd want to do so, though, given how cold it is. While a summer's day on the equator can see the thermometer rise to a respectable 20 degrees Celsius, the average temperature is a bone-chilling minus 63 Celsius. Now, for those of you who prefer Patriot units, that's the equivalent of minus 81.4 Fahrenheit. And that's just the average temperatures. In the depths of the Martian winter, things can get so cold that even Canada would be afraid to go outside. Like, minus 140 Celsius cold. And then there's the radiation. With the magnetic field gone, the Martian surface gets bombarded by radiation. Lands there, and you'd get an average daily dose of something like 0.67 millisieverts. Doesn't sound like very much, right? Well, I hate to break it to you, that's about 20% of your average yearly dose here on Earth in a single day. Imagine how that would build up over the course of a year-long mission to Mars. And now imagine how it would build up over the lifetime of a colonist who was permanently living there. Evidently, the Red Planet is no more built for humankind than Arby's is built for hot cuisine. 
That may be why NASA ended a 2018 study on the feasibility of making Mars habitable uh, with the pointed phrase, Terraforming Mars cannot be done with currently available technology. Any such efforts have to be very far into the future. So I guess that's the end of the video then, right? Thank you so much for watching. Smash that like. I, I mean, no, we're not going to end here. You know that. You can see how long the video is. Because even if terraforming is just a far off dream, there are still people working feverishly on tech that could one day make that dream come true. People who wholeheartedly believe we can eventually make Mars great again. With a project as big as terraforming an entire planet, there are many, many steps that you need to take in order to get it anywhere near remotely habitable. That means there are also many, many ways that you can structure a video about it, from a gradual step-by-step -step overview to just jumping ahead to the part where Elon Musk sets off nuclear bombs all over the poles. What we've decided to do, though, is start small and gradually build up to the big stuff. Hence why this chapter will be about something that sounds as a little more than an afterthought, but in reality is essentially to making Mars a livable world. And that essential something is improving soil quality. If we want to create a self-sustaining colony on Mars, then that colony needs to be able to grow its own food. If our goal is to turn the entire planet into a habitable world, then crops and vegetation need to be able to grow almost everywhere. Right now, that's impossible, not just due to the conditions outside. Even inside a sealed Mars base, growing crops would be a nightmare thanks to the regolith. Basically, a fancy-ass way of saying soil, a regolith is the stuff that covers Mars's surface, the stuff uh, we'd need to grow our crops in. The issue is that Martian regolith absolutely sucks for growing. It's hard and clay-like and contains almost none of the nutrients that Earth plants require. What it does contain is a whole lot of percolates, which just happen to be toxic to humans. On top of that, any Martian water used to keep plants alive will be extremely briny, and there are very few delicious vegetables that thrive when doused with salty water. In a small Mars base, NASA will probably be able to get around these issues by using hydroponics, in which plants are grown with their roots suspended in the air. But to scale up to a full colony, we will need to improve the soil, desalinate the water, and somehow get rid of the percolate. Luckily, scientists are already on the case, though. One recent method came from a team at Iowa State University, headed by undergraduate researcher Pooja Kasi Viswanathan. In a 2022 paper, the group outlined how a combination of cyanobacteria and circular farming could be used to gradually increase soil quality across the planet. One of the cool things about cyanobacteria is that they can be used to desalinate water, swapping out salt ions to make a Martian H2O palatable for plants. Using water treated this way, the team found that they could grow alfalfa in simulated Martian regolith. This is great news because alfalfa is crammed full of nutrients, but the team doesn't intend for future colonists to eat it. Instead, the alfalfa will be turned into compost and mixed back into the regolith. New plants will then be able to grow on top, creating a loop where every round of composting infuses the regolith with more nutrients that are needed to grow and sustain tastier and more delicate fruits, seeds, and vegetables. Do this enough and you'll eventually have soil that can grow much of what we grow here on Earth. Nor are the University of Iowa team the only ones thinking along these lines. Also in 2022, the Laboratory of Applied Space Microbiology at the University of Bremen, Germany, released a paper advocating the use of cyanobacteria as feedstock to grow duckweed, another fast-growing, nutrient-packed plant that could be composted into the regolith. In short, it seems that if we want to improve the quality of Martian soil, we'll need to first use circular farming to make it suitable for more crops. But what about all of that poisonous percolate? Well, the good news is that it's water-soluble, meaning it could likely be removed in the same process that extracts and treats the briny Martian water. If not, we could potentially introduce anaerobic microbes known to feed on it, letting them run rampant until enough has been devoured. Of course, all this is still just a first step, a very labor-intensive one, but far from the biggest part of terraforming. No, that would be the urgent need to return Mars's atmosphere. From the moment the magnetic field vanished, Mars was doomed. The death that followed was not a quick process. It was the result of charged particles of solar wind gradually stripping away the atmosphere until Mars was left with the thin one that it has today. That atmosphere is still being stripped away, although it seems to have reached an equilibrium. 
processes on Mars create things like carbon dioxide and methane in large enough quantities to maintain the current status quo. But that also raises an intriguing possibility. If you could somehow reactivate Mars's magnetosphere, the atmosphere would start to thicken again. It would be a slow process, but sure enough, the pressure would eventually increase. And that would likewise raise the temperature until both pressure and temperature reached the human habitable zone. Of course, restarting planetary magnetic fields is something way, way, way beyond our current capabilities. So much so that we'd probably stand a better chance of just trying to summon Q from Star Trek and asking him to do it for us. But what if we didn't need to do something so drastic? What if there was a way to give Mars the benefit of a magnetic field without actually having to mess around with, you know, a planet's core? James Green thinks such a method might exist. The former director of NASA's Planetary Science Division prior to his retirement in 2022, Green put forward a proposal in 2017 for doing just that. His solution? To hide Mars behind a giant magnetic shield. 1,084,569 kilometers from Mars lies the planet's L1 point with the Sun, the point at which the gravity of the two bodies is basically equal. Green's idea is to park a large dipole there, what the Many Worlds blog helpfully describes as, quote, a closed electric circuit powerful enough to generate an artificial magnetic field. If this dipole is capable of producing a magnetic field at the strength of one or two Tesla, and to be clear, this is still futuristic tech, then Mars should be permanently protected behind it. Picture the way a huge parasol works, casting a shadow below it to shield you from the sun. In an incredibly simplified way, this is what Green's magnetic shield would do. Mars would remain in its shadow, protected from the ravages of the solar winds, just as a sunbather can be protected from sunburn. This means the atmosphere would no longer get stripped away on a constant basis, and that means it would be able to start thickening again through natural processes. Eventually, the pressure increase would lead to heat increase. Green envisages it one day causing a 4 Celsius temperature spike across the red planet. At which point, things will get pretty interesting. A 4 Celsius hike is enough to melt the frozen CO2 over Mars's northern polar cap. The release of so much greenhouse gas would warm the planet up even faster, hopefully enough to start melting the ice water at both poles. Since the ice at the poles is thought to contain enough water to cover the whole of Mars, this could lead to some pretty seismic changes, a return of the ancient oceans that once covered our cosmic sibling. But even if things don't go that far, Green's magnetic shield would still be extremely useful. The Armstrong limit is a terrifying invisible ceiling above our planet where pressure drops to 60 millibars. At that point, the pressure is so low that water can boil at the temperatures found in the human body. Cross that limit without a protective pressurized suit and your blood will literally boil in your veins. The pressure on Mars's surface is currently a tenth of the Armstrong limit, meaning a yucky death for anyone who goes outside without a spacesuit. Install Green's shield, though, and the pressure would eventually increase until it crossed the Armstrong limit. Now, extreme sub zero temperatures and hectons of CO2 would mean that you still couldn't stand on the Martian surface without specialized equipment, but the stuff you needed to wear would be far simpler and far more flexible. Heck, during Martian summer, you'd really only need breathing equipment. And that added flexibility and ease of movement would make doing everything on Mars a lot safer and a lot faster. It's like the difference between repairing a broken window on the ISS and on an Antarctic base. Both are serious breaches, but one is a quickly fixed annoyance, while the other is a giant operation that could end in everyone's death. Reduce the need for protective gear, and humans could quickly move to doing more outdoor activities on Mars, maybe even beginning agriculture. And hey, if the atmosphere doesn't warm up fast enough at that, there are other ways to boost the temperature too. Ways that involve some of the craziest terraforming that you've ever heard of. If you have a passing interest in the terraforming of Mars, you've doubtless encountered the clip of Elon Musk's plan. In it, Musk suggests quite calmly that the secret to terraforming Mars might be to detonate nuclear bombs over its polar ice caps. The resulting flash of heat would turn the carbon dioxide ice into gas, raising the overall temperature enough to start melting the trapped water ice. Basically, it's the flashy version of James Green's plan. It has the same end goal, but changes the delivery method from hard sci-fi to maniacal supervillain. Still, it's not clear there's enough CO2 to locked up in the poles to make this a workable solution, though. Experts think it might only be enough to double the pressure, which would still leave the Martian atmosphere far too thin to support surface liquid for any significant length of time. 
No. If we want to make Mars sustainably wet and warmish, we'll need to find additional sources of greenhouse gases to utilize. One of these could be the other carbon dioxide deposits logged away in the red planet. On the surface of Mars alone, we know there are enough carbon dioxide sources to theoretically raise atmospheric pressure from 0.6% of Earth to around 14%. The good news is that would boost planetary temperatures by about 10 degrees Celsius. The bad news is that strip mining the entire planet is clearly beyond our abilities, especially for such a paltry return. This is why NASA is showing some interest in possible deep deposits of carbon-bearing minerals that could be mined in a more traditional way. While it's unknown the extent of these deposits, it could be that there's enough CO2 locked away to boost pressure to sustainable levels. If not, then we could always try mining methane. Uh, we know from data sent by various probes and rovers that Mars experiences spikes of methane in the atmosphere, presumably from some sort of natural process. Find a way to harvest or utilize this, and we might be able to create a greenhouse effect much more efficiently than we ever could with CO2. And yeah, we know. This is all incredibly speculative, almost on par with assuming we'll find greenhouse gas generating wizards hiding in Martian caves. And it comes with its own set of problems. While CO2 and methane might thicken the atmosphere and warm the planet, they will also do so in a way that leaves behind air that is supremely toxic to humans. Thankfully, this isn't the last potential step that humankind could take. There are also ways we could work to make this thick new atmosphere breathable. Back when Mars was still a water world, our Earth was a nightmare hellscape, one with an atmosphere stuffed full of carbon dioxide, methane, ammonia, and other stuff you really wouldn't want to breathe in. Yet over the course of millions of years, it slowly changed, eventually becoming the sort of atmosphere in which complex life forms could evolve. And it's all thanks to cyanobacteria. Supremely ancient creatures, cyanobacteria may have arisen as far back as the Archean era. For our purposes today, though, what's cool about them is they went on to start converting a whole load of CO2 in Earth's early atmosphere into oxygen. This didn't just help create the gas we'd later need to breathe, it also resulted in the arrival of ozone, which today protects us from harmful solar radiation. The best part is that it's thought some of these cyanobacteria could possibly survive on Mars. Species such as Chorocoridiopsis thamalis, which requires only very low levels of light to survive, a big deal since sunlight is far weaker on the red planet. Release enough of these little guys at the same time as undertaking other methods for producing a greenhouse effect, and they'd naturally begin modifying the atmosphere, taking a bite of carbon dioxide here, emitting a bit of oxygen there. Eventually, they'd be capable of turning Mars's toxic air into something breathable to humans. Even then, the red planet still wouldn't be anyone's dream holiday destination. With a lower gravity than our world, Mars can maintain an atmosphere of about 0.38 bar, similar to what you'd get high up in the Andes here on Earth. In other words, a thin, chilly atmosphere that would be uncomfortable even if you were capable of breathing it. Nonetheless, even getting to this stage would represent one of the most supreme achievements in all of human history. For all it may seem impossible, the idea that we might one day terraform Mars is not just a mad dream. It's definitely not something we could do now, there's no doubt about that, but it also might not be something that can only be achieved in another 2,000 years. James Green's magnetic shield, for example, is something he envisages being able to do by the mid-21st century. Other stuff we've covered, like the circular farming or cyanobacteria, that's possible today. Heck, even the large-scale methane mines might not be more than 100 to 150 years out. Far too late for us to witness them, but potentially something our grandchildren could live to see. In short, a temperate Mars with oceans may well lie in the future of our solar system. A future still a long way off, but perhaps closer in time to us now than many would believe. It's a shame that we'll miss it. But as we close this out, it's with a plea to any future historians looking back on this video from their Martian colony, hoping to understand how folks in the early 21st century thought about the Red Planet. A plea for these future chroniclers of days not yet past to think of us next time they look up at the Martian skies to remember, if only for a moment, all the humanity that came before. A humanity that only wishes it could be stood alongside them on the great terraformed world of Mars.